Spirit, my heart is your home. The doors are open, blow through every room. I want to hear your voice. I want to feel you move. Holy Spirit, burn like fire with me. Father, as we turn to study your commandments that you have given to us so that we may know and reflect your love in the world, that we may receive the true happiness that you have in store for us. We ask tonight that you pour forth your abundant blessing upon all gathered here. May we always know and love your will and your plan for our lives. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to go through the, the Ten Commandments and kind of pretty decent detail uh you know maybe more than than well definitely more than just what the words say and into uh into kind of what they how they play out in practical life right um and that i it's really important i think to see kind of the bigger vision i don't have a ton of time to to explain it tonight but the bigger vision of morality in the church which is that it's not just meant to be the rules, right? We can, and we're good at rules. We got, we got plenty of them um, in the church and, and throughout scripture, right? Uh, there's plenty of, plenty of new, new things, but um, it's, they're never meant to be just for their own sake. Um, if we start to see them only for their own sake, we lose sight of, of where they come from, which is the will of God, which is always good. Right, which always has a positive uh, happiness quotient for us, right? And that doesn't mean that every, every time we follow the commandments, we will always be happy. Not how that works. It's not quid pro quo. But rather that, that by following these commandments, they lead to an ultimate happiness, right? Um, there are low-level happinesses, right? So, for example, you don't have $5, but you really want that drink out of 7-Eleven and you take it, uh, you, you will receive a greater pleasure short term in, because you will have the drink that you wouldn't have. But long term, it does not pay off, right? Uh, whether you're caught or not. That, that there is a certain sense in which short term, we can gain by not following these rules. But long term, there is something missing. And so that applies not only to what we talk about tonight, but also for throughout the rest of um, or the next, I guess, five weeks, which is um, the preparation and kind of um, the understanding how does God want us to live in order to be happy. That being said, the second part of this is also going to be kind of a, a, a long, yeah, long-winded, long-explained examination of conscience, right? Um, you know, everyone who, and if you're not being baptized, you have to go to confession before the Easter Vigil. No, it's scary, uh, say some, uh, but the, this, these will help you kind of look at your whole life and, and see what, where have I failed, right? And, you know, some things are going to be not applicable to you. For example, uh, next week we'll talk about keep holy the Sabbath. We'll talk about going to Mass on Sunday. Nobody expected you to go to Mass before you became Catholic, right? Um, and so... There's no obligation in that, right? So, but, but for, for everything we talk about uh, tonight applies no matter where you are, uh, at least in the Christian journey. Um, and then even afterwards, the acceptance of God, uh, how that kind of plays out uh, in different ways. So well, let's just jump right in to the first commandment. First commandment, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. So the first commandment is kind of shortened oftentimes to you to uh, you shall not have any other gods besides the true God. And that sounds kind of easy enough, although it's kind of confusing if you understand the uh, kind of some of the background uh, of the Old Testament, which is when this is written, right, the Ten Commandments coming from Moses, you know, Moses receives them while the uh, Israelites are wandering in the desert kind of very early on in their journey. They receive these, these Ten Foundational Commandments. Well, to them, 
to the Israelites, there might have been one true God of Israel, but they also believed that all the other gods existed. Right? It's kind of one of those things that we, we don't really recognize. Um, they actually were polytheistic in the sense that they, they knew that this is our God, but like Apollo was real over in Greece, right? It wasn't that he, he just wasn't as powerful as ours. He wasn't as good as ours. The, the Hittites had a God and actually several gods and they were, they were powerful. They weren't as good. They weren't, they weren't our God and we shouldn't worship him. So, so there is kind of this understanding of, for them of many gods. So it's not quite as simple as like not recognizing. Now, of course, as time goes on, uh, in the Old Testament, and definitely by the time of the New Testament, there was a complete rejection of all other gods. They weren't to be accepted in any way, shape, or form. But the key to it is that God demands of us a unique understanding of himself. Um, and that is an actively good thing. Why? One, because it's true. There is no being quite like God. And so to try and claim that there is leads us to a life of falsity. And that's never going to work, right? To have a duplicitous thought uh, doesn't work. Uh, it always leads to chaos. It always leads to consternation and eventually to collapse. But, but just as much, it's because we cannot truly... Uh, we cannot truly follow after a thought that isn't real. And so God says, follow me in, in all of my ways. He, it's actually kind of amazing because it's whenever he talks in this way, he usually refers throughout the Old Testament in, in certain terms. He actually refers to himself more than once as a jealous God. It's kind of a funny thing because jealousy is a capital sin. Um, it's, it's one of those those big problems to have, right? Jealousy is not, is not really described ever as a good thing. So how can we possibly look at this and see it as good? How can we possibly look at God as a jealous God and say that's, that's a positive? Well, because he knows in a way that, that nothing else that we cannot be, that for him to be jealous means that he wants us to desire him above all things and, and, every, and above anything else. Um, that means that we are correct, incorrect in a correct ordered life. Um, that if we desire him above all things of this earth, then we will truly be happy. So he refers himself as a jealous God so that we would be jealous of him. It sounds weird, but... Um, but as we lean into it, we'll see, um, see that it is, uh, it is for our benefit. So let's look at, uh, at it in context of the three theological virtues, right? So just as the Ten Commandments are often depicted on two tablets, and the first three are on the, the, the tablet in, in Moses' dominant hand, and then uh, the last seven are, in the, are on the other tablet. It's purposefully uneven. Why? Because the first three refer to God and how man's right, correct relation with him is, and the last seven uh, are, reveal, or yeah, have something to do with dealing with uh, our fellow man, love of God above all things, and our neighbor as ourself. And so well, first we have the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. These have their object as God. So what do we, when we're pointing to them, we are pointing toward, or when we're using them, we are always pointed towards God. So, faith has to deal with our knowledge of God, the the correct, correctly ordered knowledge of God. And so, when we kind of talk about um, about about this, or use this class as an examination of conscience. I'm just going to give you kind of some of the sins against faith that can occur, not that you have done, but. Rather, maybe you've chosen over time, but also um, some of them actually don't apply to you. Uh, but, but at the same time, uh, we'll just turn to what the Catechism has to say um, on sinning against faith. And the first is voluntary doubt. Now, both of those words have to go together um, because we're all going to... No, we're not... We're not not guaranteed, but almost everybody at some point in their life will have a temptation to doubt, right? Kind of a quick thought of, wait, what if this isn't real, right? What if, what if this isn't exactly what 
what God says it is, right? And we, you know, that's fine. The devil deceives, right? It's, it's what he's been doing since the very beginning. The story of Adam, Adam and Eve, and, you know, they, they, there's kind of a suggestion that um, the take of that fruit wasn't the first time he tried that, right? That it was, a, it was something he did over and over again. It was very obnoxious of him um, and something that we should. But to voluntarily doubt, to choose to doubt that's not a temptation. That's us saying, well, let's just let me critically examine this truth of the faith. That we're allowed to do. I've read textbooks on the Eucharist. Doesn't mean that I doubted its presence. It's just that it means I, I really have dove into the subject matter. That's a good thing, actively a good thing. Um, but rather to say, you know what? I don't know. I'm just going to I'm just going to be content with staying in this doubt, right? Without talking to anybody uh, who would who would have some insight into it, uh, without uh, allowing myself any any wiggle room, um, but rather to just say this isn't real. Or maybe it's maybe it's it is what the church has said, right? The church really does think this fact, but I'm just going to re- reject it as as God didn't reveal it, and therefore. I live my own life. The, the, next, the next is called, is very, very much um, related, which is incredulity, which mean, basically means unbelief, which is neglect of a revealed truth or willful refusal to assent to it and to general skepticism. So more voluntarily, voluntary doubt was like on one aspect or one teaching. This is kind of a more general uh, approach. The next is one that if you spend too much time online, as I do, uh, you'll hear too often. Um, and it's, the, it's heresy, um, which is the obstinate post-baptismal denial of a truth, of some truth which must be believed with divine and Catholic apostolic faith, or an obstinate doubt concerning the same. Those words all are important. So obstinate post-baptismal denial of some truth. So, can a pagan be a heretic? No. Why? Because they don't, they have not been baptized. Can somebody who says something incorrect online be a heretic? No. Because obstinate means that they they won't back down off of what they believe or what they have stated that is incorrect. Um, Does does being wrong mean that you're a heretic? Well, not formally, it could be materially, but, but we have to uh, not just be incorrect, but refuse some truth. So when it's been presented to hold it afterwards, that's when it becomes problematic. Oftentimes we'll talk about heresy and it becomes every time I disagree with your opinion, right? Much, and just don't stay away from that. <laughs> stay away from that kind of uh, talk. It's, it's not healthy. Um, but it is a real problem, right? And it is something that um, has led people astray. Even, it, but I will tell you what one of my professors said uh, first year of theology. Don't worry about being heretics. None of you are smart enough to be one, right? That, that the, like heresy is not something you kind of stumble across. It's something you, uh, uh, it, you know, really bright people are heretics uh, who, who write things and, and refuse to back down off of it. That being said, I did have a professor, or I didn't have the professor, but there is a theologian, I think he actually has since passed, named Germaine Grise. And he's a little bit debatable about how useful his, his work was, but he wrote a lot and, and it was all pretty good stuff. But at a certain point, he wrote some very detailed moral theological qu- ethical question, right? About um, whether a certain medical procedure could be used or whether it was uh, immoral. And he wrote it out, he wrote out his answer, and then he wrote at the end, but this is still up for debate within the church, and if the church decides to uh, rule in, in the opposite, then I recant this position. That's a very beautiful way to res- respond, right? Is to say, I don't actually, I much more care to hold to my faith than to hold to what I think, right? Which sounds kind of crazy, um, unless we know, uh, unless we have true trust that the authority is real. Um, and, and knowing, of course, that, um, the, you know, 
there are certain things the church cannot rule on, right? So uh, we've talked about infallibility and we've talked about how the, the Pope can't come out tomorrow and say two plus two equals five. Or, I mean, you can say it, but we don't have to believe it, right? Um, and so with that in mind, uh, that's why he knew he could say that. That's what faith is. It says, I believe I assent to it on these matters. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't mean every matter. The next is schism. Uh, which is a refusal to submit to the Roman pontiff or, or of the communion with him. So, um, there's schism, schism is something you, you really, um, you know, if you, you know, you know, the Orthodox Church, for example, is probably the most famous schism in the history of Christianity in 1054, the Great Schism, which is really kind of a misnomer because they didn't really, um, they didn't really quite get it uh, in the same way. Uh, they didn't really understand that's what they were doing when they did it. Not to say they didn't want to break up, but they didn't know that that's what was happening. Um, like, I don't think they like like they didn't set out to break into two halves of the church, right? Um, what they they set out to do was um, was something much smaller. And actually, many people for centuries afterwards they really thought they were part of one church. Um, but we'd say 1054 because it's easier to say than what I just said. Um, but basically, any group uh, communion that refuses to uh, submit to the Roman pontiff is in schism. Um, and then they happen. The most recent one, famously at least, at least, or popularly in any sort of way, is known as SSPX. This is kind of a controversial opinion, but I really don't think it should be. Um, they refuse to submit to the Holy Father. They refuse to say that he is legitimate successor to St. Peter and that... Um, and that he has a right to do things that he, uh, he claims, which are within his rights. And so uh, they refuse to submit to him. Um, they're in schism. It's kind of weird, and the Pope actually has given them a lot of leeway, but um, be attentive. You, you may hear about it. They'll, they're known very famous, most prominently because they, uh, they celebrate the traditional Latin Mass um, exclusively. The next is apostasy which is a total repudiation of, of the Christian faith, which basically means that you were Christian, Catholic, whatever, um, and, but any Christian, and then later deny the divinity of Christ. Um, to, to move that way is an apostasy. Uh, um, and you really have to hold fast to it. Um, there was an early Roman emperor named Julian, uh, and actually, if you want to separate him out from all the other Julians in history, he's known as Julian the Apostate. Uh, because after some of the early Roman emperors became Catholic, and or at, least at this point everyone was Christian, so they say Christian, um, he looked around and said, you know, the empire has kind of fallen apart a little bit over the last 70 years since we've been Christian, and I think it's because the emperors are Christian. I'm going to go back to paganism. We tended to make more money that way. And so he did. And he... And he became an apostate. Um, it turns out it didn't work. It actually sped up the collapse of the Roman Empire. But that's neither here nor there. Um, that's, those are those offenses against faith. All right. The next, are there any questions on that? Good. Then there's uh, hope. Hope is the desire for things unseen. And it's always a good thing. And our ultimate hope is in God, that we can have union with him. Um, and there are two major sins against hope, presumption and despair. They sit on opposite ends of the spectrum of, of, of virtue. So hope sits in the middle. It is a healthy desire for that which is good. The first, uh, the, mo the extreme, one extreme is presumption, which is that I'm going to, it's fine. I will definitely attain union with God no matter what happens, right? So we never really seek any type of, contri we have no contrition. We don't seek reconciliation with God. It's all, I, I, I got it. It'll be fine. The other is despair, which is I can never, God will never show me his mercy. There's nothing, I, I don't believe that I will attain this good thing. Um, in between is the right place to be. To recognize we are sinners and yet God has saved us. That, that the gap is infinite yet it's been paid and filled in because of what Christ has won for us. That it is a historical fact but it is also still lived in the church today. And so we work for it insofar as God has called us to work for it, but he has done the greater work um, that we just have to cooperate with, um, which is right in that 
that place of hope. Um, and remember, those despair and, and presumption should, should remind you of those sins against the Holy Spirit. Um, and then the last is, is charity. So faith, hope, and charity. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Um, and there are five sins against, against charity of God. The first is indifference. Uh, these ones are pretty easy, so I'm just going to go through them a little more quickly. Indifference, ingratitude, lukewarmness, what's known as achadia, which is spiritual sloth or laziness, and then hatred of God. Now, most of you probably have not hated God, um, but I imagine that everyone kind of look into their own heart and see moments where we've been either indifferent towards them or not grateful. Um, and definitely lukewarm. I think everyone has, has moments of lukewarmness. Um, but all of them kind of, and lukewarmness and achadia obviously are very much, very similar. Now let's talk about the positive aspects of this, which, um, which is uh, the three things that we are called to do, right? Because every commandment has a has kind of a, a negative immediate effect, and then there's also a positive effect. And we're going to actually come back to those ones. The first is adoration. So that, that worship of him that is due and only due to God alone. Um, so we acknowledge him as God and give him the proper glory as creator, savior, Lord, and master. Um, higher than any type of, of veneration, that dulia that we give to the saints, there's a reason why we walk in the church, we genuflect to the tabernacle, but we don't genuflect towards the uh the statues statues around uh the church right that'd be kind of inappropriate right we we reserve even our bodily movements just to the presence of god um we do that often through prayer and sacrifice those expressions of thanksgiving and glory those expressions of contrition and supplication that we that we turn to him in our words and actions uh these these three things, adoration, prayer, and sacrifice. So to ignore those uh, becomes a sin in, in their own way. Now, this is the one that always, I think, uh, we're going to talk about the um, ways in which we live uh, idolatry in the world today. And I think people usually tend to get uh, kind of two things. One, people's antennas start going up because they're like, ooh, shouldn't have done that in my life. Uh, and then the other one is, is like, even if you're like, I've never done any of those things, it's still kind of like fun because there's something just like natural within us to, to understand the spiritual realm. Um, and so this is where we start talking about certain, uh, well, lack of a better word, but it's also the proper word of, of demonic stuff. Um, so let's jump right in. So the first is actually probably... Um, probably less less serious, which is superstition, um, which actually just means an excess, a perverse excess of religion, which sounds like something that's impossible to do. Um, this is often a venial sin. I mean, it's really hard to mortally sin in this one, uh, it's because it's usually pretty good. But like, um, I remember my, my liturgy professor saying like, you know, you really, we needed a reform right before Vatican II because you used to see these like Italian women and they'd go up before a statue and they'd be like wiping their eyes and they'd be crying and they'd be bowing down to Mary and they'd be, you know, throwing coins into her lap and all these like weird little ritualistic things. And then they'd walk over and they'd walk right by the tabernacle without even so much as a head bow, right? Like they just like refused to acknowledge God, but they thought that the statue had power, right? Or, um... Or like, I mean, I, I carry around a rosary in my pocket and it's good, but like um, to kind of uh, treat even holy objects with like too much respect, uh, you know, kind of like a, like I can't do something without it, right? Like that, I mean, it's good. It's good to, it's good to, I like, I, I prefer to, ha to celebrate mass with a rosary in my pocket, but like, I'm not going to not celebrate mass because I don't have it. Right? That would be inappropriate. That would be too much of a religious practice. The next is idolatry itself, which basically 
we're attributing divine attributes to anything other than God. Um, a lot of times it's kind of, it, it, it plays out in like kind of a polytheism, right? So kind of related to that superstition, but, but to false images. So, um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's usually not seen too often nowadays, but, um, but at the same time, I think there are, there are definitely things that, that, um, you know, kind of come up in, in less Christian parts of the world, like East Asia, um, certain parts of South America still have, uh, kind of too much devotion to certain spots on the earth, right? Um, you see certain paganism around things like Stonehenge, right? Which is fine to go visit, but like to, to think that special powers are going to come out of that spot, right? Like, okay, that's, that's, it's excessive. It's, it's, we're, we're giving, uh, we're giving to creature what is due to God, right? Which is what we're trying to avoid. Um, if we intentionally do it, um, then it, then it becomes a mortal sin. It separates us completely from relationship with God. If, if we kind of stumble into it, um, if, we're, if we're not really trying to take away from God, like it's a venial sin. But we can also kind of see in, in a... Um, I mean, it's, it's both absolutely true, but it's also kind of an analogous way of, of making an idol out of money, fame, things, uh, even family, uh, other relationships can all be sort of idols. Why? Because we're called to love God with our, all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. If we are actively pursuing any of those other things instead of God, then we've given that thing primary place in our life. We, you know, if, I mean, the guy working 15 hours a day, I mean, it's not, not a bad thing to work hard and, you know, but the, the, I don't know, I'm thinking more like the stockbroker who's working 80 hour to 100 hour weeks. Um, that, that's disordered, right? <laughs> right? Like it's, it's, um, it's putting money and the job ahead of God and family and right order to life. Um, so, you know, to have to work, I mean, uh, you know, to, to be called out and to have to work 12 hour days, like from time to time, that's not idolatry. Don't overreact. Right. Uh, to, to have to sit. I mean, I watch, I mean, I thought it was one of the greatest acts of love I've ever seen. I watched a wife, uh, basically never leave the side of her husband as, as he was dying in the hospital, like slept on the couch in the room, the whole nine yards. It was beautiful, right? Like that's not idolatry. Uh, that's, that's genuine love and sacrifice. Um, but we also can see, um, that it does happen that we sometimes choose other things above God when we should be choosing God. The next is uh, divination and magic, which basically is a recourse to the spiritual realm that is not of God, right? So not turning to angels for intercession or the saints, um, but rather um, to, to look towards... Uh, Towards, towards the demonic, um, even if it's not necessarily stated as such. So what kind of things does that come out? Well, some things are really childish, but also, you know, surprisingly common. Uh, I remember, it was a while ago now, but there was the, like Charlie Charlie videos, right? Where they, where they were calling upon this Charlie to answer questions, right? Turns out like, you know, they were getting real answers or Ouija boards, right? Like all these things, like, like it's not necessarily that we're like calling like devil, you need to come and help me with this. No, very few people are doing that. Um, but, but we're calling upon other spirits that are not God to answer things about stuff that we shouldn't know, that we have no right to know. Um, so what kind of things does that usually look like? Horoscopes, astrology, palm reading, interpret interpreting omens or lots, uh, clairvoyance, and recourse to mediums um, are basically uh, that. Are des are they, they're basically showing the desire to have power over time, history, and other human beings, right? So those things are to be avoided and are act actually sinful um, to, to do, right? We, we found out that they just opened one of these shops in, in La Plata, but um, there, there must be 15 of them between here and the Beltway on, on 301, 
right? These little palm reading shops, right? So they become very common. Uh, I think I, I, I annoyed a guy not two, three weeks ago and his daughter was like, I'm a medium. And I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> like, I mean, first off, you're not. Uh, and second off, uh, even if you are, like, you're not going to be any help here. Um, you're not going to get, you're not going to get your father to heaven because you're a medium. That's not how that works. Um, but the problem is what we do when we're, when we, when we approach these things is we allow, we give our will over to a spirit that we don't know. That's always dangerous. God always shows himself. And he oftentimes doesn't allow us to have the powers that we need because we don't need them truly for our ultimate goal of salvation. Sometimes he does offer these charisms. We talked about charisms several, a couple of months back. Um, but here we're looking at the false charisms because, they do not, because their source are not of God. Um, here's the rule. If you don't, <laughs> if it's not... Uh, if it's not of God, it's not something you want, right? If it's not in his, you know, the narrow way, uh, remember how often he talks about that. It's easier for a, rich, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to gain, the, uh, the, to gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, he's, you know, there are many who will try, few will, few will succeed, right? That all of these things kind of point to it is him and him alone. I am the way, the truth, the life. Um, all those who follow me will gain eternal life, but there is no other way. So we need to be attentive to shedding um, those those attachments to past sins against God uh, via magic. Um, and then we often refer to this whole category as occult. Occult coming from the word basically mean hidden. Uh, why? Because the Ouija board looks pretty innocuous, right? The reality is it's just a bunch of letters and a thing. I don't really know. I've never done it. But like like all of these things, I mean, tarot cards look like look like playing cards. They're hidden, but underneath is is an attachment to a, to a spiritual realm that we have no business being a part of and have no desire to be a part of if we knew. Um, we should also be attentive to um, to charms and stones. Uh, or anything that, you know, things... I get very nervous about talks of energy, just in general. Why? Because energy is another word basically for spirit. It is a force that we do not see, right? Which is basically spirit. Um, and if we don't know from where it comes, if we know if it's not coming from God, well, it's got to come from somewhere, or it's false. And if it's false, then we have no business touching it. And if it's real and it moves things, then we better know where it's coming from. And if we don't know exactly where it is, if it's not revealed by God, if it's hidden, still it's something that is by definition evil um and we'll often see kind of a spiritism or basically magical practices that are done in kind of a natural sort of way so things like voodoo uh you know a lot of kind of tribal practices um, most of which are lost in the anglo world but very much present uh, in certain uh, Central and Caribbean, Central American and, and Caribbean cultures, um, as well as African and uh, Southeast Asia, but basically, you know, we can we can use natural remedies, right? Like, um, you know, you can kind of you can take ginseng and you, you know, like all that kind of stuff. Like, like don't think you can't use herbs. Um, some of that stuff is just known, but but at the same time, there are kind of traditional cures that we need to be attentive to. I remember, for example, I, um, a woman who, oh my gosh, where is she from? Now I'm blanking. Pretty small country in Southeast Asia. And, um, and but she, they had some medicine that they used. It was, it was just some herbs, really. But instead of kind of following the traditional ways of having you know, the, the grandmother offer a blessing, they called me over and they said, well, we think it worked. We think, I mean, it's just plant root, you know, like, it, and so which was fine. Um, but we don't want, we're not calling upon ancestors. We want to call upon the power of, of God, right? That's good, right? That's baptizing something that, that we can handle. All right, we're going to talk about three, three uh, sins against irreligion. 
The first is tempting God. Uh, anybody who went to Mass this past Sunday, which hopefully was all of you, uh, on the first Sunday of Lent, heard the three temptations of Jesus, or, yeah, of Jesus by the devil in the desert. Uh, the first was... Uh, you know, turn the stone into bread. The second was all the kingdoms of the world. And the third was throw yourself off this parapet and the angels will come and save you. And what, is God, what does Jesus say? You shall not tempt the Lord your God, right? <laughs> that, 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 that is a pretty explicit sin uh, in scripture. The next is sacrilege, which is the use of a religious or holy object for uh, an immoral purpose or a, an inappropriate purpose. Um, so some of the stuff is... Uh, is kind of, is, is more serious than others, right? Um, so the highest would be a sacrilege against the Eucharist, right? So taking the Eucharist and, and allowing somebody else to, to use it, you know, in some sort of religious rite or, or um, even just keeping the Eucharist in your home is, is a sacrilege. Um, you know, it's, it's there to be consumed and then to, um, and to receive it, but not to, to manipulate it as, as you will. Um, and, you know, I remember, uh, for example, so I got ordained in June of 2016. In September of 2016, I went back to Rome. Um, and so my family gifted me a chalice uh, for my ordination. So I got it in June. And then when I left in uh, September, I, I, I was going to Rome. I didn't, you don't need a chalice in Rome. And so I left it in my, in my parents' house and it was just in the box and it was, you know, it was, it was protected, all that kind of stuff. And I just left it in the corner, not to be touched. And I got back and my sister made a crack and she was joking. Um, she goes, wait a second, that thing's been sitting here the whole time. We could have been drinking out of it every day if we wanted to. And you know, it's nice. And she was just trying to take me off and it worked. Um, but but like that would be a sacrilege, right? This consecrated object for the purpose of mass she wanted to use to drink like juice out of, right? Okay, no, don't do that. Um, we don't want to do that. Uh, things that are consecrated to God remain in God's protection. Um, that being said, if you have, uh, you know, if you kind of, if you if you're like unsure of what to do with a with a um, holy image or or a sacramental. Like, just talk to the priest. We'll know how to get rid of it. The last is one that you probably will not have much trouble with, which is simony, which is actually one of my favorites because uh, it's such a funny story of, in Scripture, in my mind, which is basically uh, this, this magician wanted to buy the powers of St. Peter. Right? He was like, he's like, you can like heal people and uh, you can you, you like do really fancy things. Like, I want to do that. So like, if I can do that, like, I will give you a lot of money. To, to have that power. And Peter goes, no, not going to happen. You're dead now, right? Because that was one of the powers of Peter, um, is he could just kill people by saying it. Not that he did it that often, but he did do it a couple of times. But so in Acts 8.20, if you want to, you know, fact check me, uh, Peter, St. Peter says to Simon, Simon Magus, your money perished with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God, right? So the purchase of religious goods, um, Religious power, that is, um, which is why we're very attentive never to sell blessed objects in the church or we don't sell relics. Um, you know, obviously, like things like, you know, the altar cloths we buy or make or um, the chalice I mentioned we bought, right? But then you bless it, uh, not before. And then the last sin against, uh, against, uh, well, God, I guess the first commandment would be basically atheism and agnosticism. It's not something to to worry about, but just to round out the whole topic that's there. The a rejection of God is, 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 is going to be sinful always. The second part of the first commandment is not to make graven images, which is kind of a difficult one these days, because as you, you can even just look around this room, not so much right behind me, but around the room, you will see many images of of people, of saints, of, of creaturely things, and, and that doesn't make any sense if you don't think that we should make any graven images. Well, part of it is because in the New Testament that's been revealed that what God looks like. So we're not making a guess at what God's nature is, but rather he has shown himself in Jesus Christ. It's so much so that St. Paul writes in uh, Colossians, first chapter of Colossians, verse 15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. 
Um, and then one of the fathers of the church, St. Basil, says that the veneration given to the image is actually transferred to the thing imaged. So uh, if you have an image of, of Mary and you say the Hail Mary in front of it, it's, it's, it's as if it is given to her, right? Uh, the crucifix in the church upstairs, if you're praying in front of it, nobody thinks you think that the, well, you, nobody should think that you think that the wood has any special power, but rather that the connection because we always know through our senses the connection that is made in our mind with that particular image actually allows us to connect to God in a special way. And then the last, and then the second commandment that we'll talk about is, is the second commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, which very quickly, if you remember nothing else about this commandment, it means don't say his name. Or at least don't very often. If we say his name, his power becomes apparent. It becomes present. And so we should avoid the use of his name at all costs, except for in prayer. So what are the... And then we also apply this not only to the name of Jesus and God, uh, but also to, the, to Mary and the rest of the saints. So the sins, the, the, the three, we'll talk about the three major sins against uh, against the second commandment. The first is a blasphemy, right? To curse the name of God or to offer or to utter anything ill against it. Um, you know, also the saints and sacred things of the church. Um, in itself, this is a mortal sin. The next is a false oath, which is uh, um, slightly, slightly different but using, using a slightly different perjury, but calling God's holy name to witness a falsehood. Um, and, then, and then there is perjury as the third one, which is to make a promise under oath with no intention of keeping it or failing to keep a promise made under oath. Um, so, so basically we're just trying not to use his name. Uh, to swear to God. I like, even things like, yeah, I swear to God, right? Um, has this this kind of covenantal relationship to it that we don't want to break, right? And I think that's kind of it. Now, there is a certain, you know, culpability that is lessened by habit and all these kind of things, right? So if you're in the bad habit of saying God's name, like, break it, but, but know that you're not going to go to hell because of one utterance of it next time. Um, but, but we do want to stay away because, because the actions whether from our mouths or from any other part of our body, do actually reveal something of the heart. And so to constantly misuse his name uh, actually does do us some spiritual damage. And it's something we should uh, strive to avoid as, as best as possible. So uh, obviously the second commandment, much less uh, to say about it because it's a bit more direct. Um, but it still has this kind of greatness and being able to express in its brevity the the power of the name of God, right? If you look to the Jewish culture, they didn't even uh, ever write out the full name of God. It was often spoken that, uh, you know, we even say Yahweh as as the Old Testament name for God. And even look, some people actually say, actually, that might not have been the right way to say it because they never wrote it out. Uh, and so what we need to, to look for is less... Um, is less trying to find out the information about it, but rather to, to offer the respect for the presence. Why? Because if we look to the story, I love this, the, the, the rest of the Moses story of the burning bush, right? He goes to the burning bush, he sees that this is some sort of miracle, and he gets sent to the Israelites to, to lead them to freedom, and he says, well, what am I supposed to say when they, what's your, what's your name? Like when, when I come to this, to them, they're going to ask, they're going to say, well, who sent you? And I'm going to have to say a name. And he's, and there's kind of an interesting thing because, because God says my name is I am, right? But why is, why was that? It was kind of an audacious question because we give names to things that are below us, right? I, I name my pets, right? Uh, Mothers and fathers name their children, right? The ones who have authority over are the ones who give names. Uh, so to call out somebody's name like that kind of gives a power um, to it. So when we look to this second commandment, we're looking to 
uh, ordering ourselves correctly in front of God, not to say, I, I am the one who make you God, which is kind of how we think in the back of our head sometimes. Uh, you're God as long as I recognize you as such. And rather to say, I, I so recognize your greatness that I want to treat your very name with such respect. It used to be a tradition that when you said the name of Jesus, even in Mass, you would remove your hat. Uh, and so we kind of just are attentive to that, that, these, that the name has a power. Every knee must bend in heaven on the earth and under the earth, St. Paul says at the name of Jesus, that, that when we look to these two commandments, we look to showing the proper respect to God in our actions and in our words, that his will may always be done, that his name be always glorified, and that we may respond with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength to all that he has offered to us. Let us pray. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, all the holy angels and saints, may the blessing of Almighty God come down upon you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.